Yes, you were born free in this valley. It's your home and all your hopes and dreams. But it has to go. Now that was progress, wasn't it? You cannot stand... No, you can't stand in the way of progress, or progress will run over you. Nobody seems to give a hoot about Rexford, Montana. You probably don't know that Rexford sits along the Kootenai River about eight miles south of Canada in Montana's northwest corner. You probably don't know that in just a few years it will be sitting under 150 feet of Kukanusa Lake behind Libby Dam. You probably don't know why there is even a town there. The town of Rexford mushroomed into being when the Great Northern Railroad was extending to Fernie, British Columbia for coal. People of every description appeared and disappeared, looking for work or adventure or profits. Rexford had become a lusty, thriving frontier town. In 1903, the railroad altered the line from Gateway and built a depot about a mile upriver to serve both the Fernie line and the new main line. So the town of Rexford began to disintegrate as buildings tumbled to the earth to be loaded onto wagons, hauled to the new site, and rebuilt. Through the determination of its residents, Rexford developed a school and churches in its early years. The town became modern and prosperous. In 1925, the Rexford Fire District was established. A railroad roundhouse was built in the early years. Several helper engines were stationed in Rexford to boost the trains up the grade east, and there were four section crews located there. The railroad payroll averaged from twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per month. Threats of the town being flooded by a dam on the Kootenai began in the late forties, and since that time the town has steadily deteriorated economically as well as in appearance. Leo Collar, lifetime resident and storekeeper for twenty years, says, well, see, this uh, dam has been in the mill for many, many years. In fact, when we first came back from Alaska in 48 or 49, they held a, a meeting here at the community hall talking about what would happen when the dam was going to be built. Well, over the period of 48, 49 to 69, uh, we haven't had new people in the area, and it's uh, because of the threat of the dam. They wouldn't come in and locate permanently. And as a result, it has seriously hurt this area economically. Let me take you into Rexford with me. I swing east off Highway 37, cross the main line of the Great Northern Railway, round a curve, and am on the main street of Rexford. I'm on the north end of the street, and a few scattered houses, barns, and sheds are on the slope to the left, while Great Northern boxcars rest on the siding to my right. Bare cottonwood trees are visible, but dark green fir and pine dominate the scene, bordering the main street for a way, and covering surrounding hills and mountains except for some startling white patches which have been clear-cut by loggers. I pass what must be an auto junkyard under the three feet of snow. I notice the white schoolhouse with its green shutters and bell on top. And then I stop at a small service station, and it is now obvious that I am in the center of a little village. Two men, one with a ladder on his shoulder, the other with a short fishing pole in his hand, have been walking toward me, and they part company by the station. Inside the station are two young boys pointing to candy in a wooden framed glass counter. It smells like only the small country station or store can. A sweet mixture of car oil, candy, bread, and rubber auto parts. Further along, in small pink buildings, are Collar's Grocery and the Post Office. And at the end of the street, a sign across the top of the square-fronted store building reads, William L. Fuchs, General Merchandise. The Fuchs store is somewhat of a landmark. It was moved from the old town location to a new building just east of the Rexford Depot in 1903. Like many another of its kind, it handled everything from beans and frying pans to fish poles, lace edgings, drugs, school supplies, and logging equipment not to mention all the local news and messages. He describes the store as... Constant changing things. There's a hardware, clothing, 
combination of a very old and very new Hoover. Besides Main Street, Rexford consists of about three scattered residential areas, a half dozen business establishments, a sawmill, a planer mill, and a shop and work area of St. Regis Paper Company. The town lacks a sewer system, although it does have a dump, a water system, and approximately five miles of paved streets. A mayor and city council were elected in 1966 to cope with questions and problems created by the dam issue. The incorporated town, a mile and a half long, is a strip of land on the east bank of the Kootenai and covers an area of approximately 1,000 acres, according to Mayor Jack Parrish. It has a population of between 300 and 400 persons, and the residents of the town are employed primarily by the logging and sawmill industries, by farming, by the forest service, or by construction. What about the people? They feel about the town being flooded. They feel the same as anyone being forced from their home, and for many of them, the little valley on the Kootenai has been the home of their parents and grandparents as well. Some say they feel worse not about their homes, but about what is being done to the country. The people are a little bit hostile, but mostly sad. Some contend that the dam is not justifiable by the reasons given, power, flood control, and recreation. But most feel they are in the way of progress and must step aside for it. Several families have already left the town. Many others have a definite place in mind they will go to. Yet, a good number of the residents don't know what they will do. Some are still waiting for land settlements with the government. As 73-year-old Mrs. W. F. Logston says, Our house isn't much. We, If we went to sell it to the individual, we wouldn't get much for it. And you go someplace else and try to buy a house. You're going to Eureka, and, and they're just out of, pro out of sight, the prices are. Rexford residents, after lodging a number of complaints, by this stage know their home will soon be underwater. They have taken the attitude described by their lumberjack mayor, Jack Parrish, a graduate of the UM Forestry School. As far as the dam, it's south, uh, I'm not too happy. So we're here, we, we realize what's happening, it's nothing we can do about it, now we're going to do the best we can and uh, have the best community we can. The town will be relocated on a bench just above the dam high water level, a few miles from the present site. But as Rexford looks forward somewhat expectantly, it also looks back nostalgically. Many memories will be buried beneath the floodwaters. Many sentimental landmarks will go beneath the dam. Many will have memories like those of Mrs. Alice Beers. As although she will stay as long as she can, she will leave without griping or crying when the time comes to go. But she will cry, just as she did when she talked about leaving, and just as many others will when they leave the little valley on the Kootenai. In 1964, Canada and the United States entered into the Columbia River Treaty, or CRT. Four dams were constructed, three in British Columbia, Canada, and the fourth in the United States in Lincoln County, known as the Libby Dam. As part of the treaty, the United States must deliver to Canada half of the estimated increase in U.S. downstream power benefits, known as the Canadian Entitlement. According to the U.S. Entity Regional Recommendation for the Future of the CRT, which was completed in 2013, they state, there is an awareness that an imbalance has developed in equitable sharing of the downstream power benefits. And, the health of the Columbia River ecosystem should be a shared benefit and cost of both the United States and Canada. Lincoln County has not and does not receive any compensation from the treaty, though Libby Dam resides in it. To make way for the dam in Lincoln County, the communities of Ural, Worland, and Old Rexford were flooded. Because of the flooding, the railroad relocated miles of track. Generational homesteads were lost, people relocated. Lincoln County lost 10% of its taxable base. But perhaps the most concerning for Lincoln County is Article 13, Section 2 of the CRT, which gives Canada the right to divert up to 1.5 million acre-feet out of almost 6 million acre-feet of annual flow.
Not only would this increase the selenium concentrations in the reservoir from coal mining in Canada, but it would also adversely affect the flow of the water at the dam, the endangered fish species, and the little recreation the reservoir provides. As evidenced in the photos, the reservoir is only at capacity very little throughout the year, decreasing potential recreational benefits to the county. It is also causing new erosion around its banks.